You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had a, a discussion or a dialogue with someone who has said something like this. Well, I, I, I hope I'm good enough to get to heaven. I hope that I've done good enough things. And in fact, I've heard several people, even in this church, talk about that need to perform, that need to do good stuff so that we're good enough to get into heaven. Um, now, those of you who have uh, gotten to know me at all know that, that, that um, that's really not theology that I believe. And in fact, the reality is that what Cheryl was talking about is true. Yes, we all are sinners. Yes, we all fall short of the glory. Yes, we all make mistakes. Yes, none of us are perfect. But indeed, we not be, may not be perfect. But what does God look at? Um, and I think I asked you several weeks ago, how many of you here this morning are perfect? Can I just see your hands? Boy, last time at least I got one. Oh, thank you, Wolf. Uh, how many of you are per- uh, how many of you are perfect? Have no flaws. Lowell is our representative this morning. But you know, the truth of the matter is that Lowell is right. You see, when we walk into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are transformed. We are made new. The old is gone, and the new has come. And if we believe what Scripture says, and we believe the passage that we mentioned this morning, we have to believe that God takes what is and trans- transforms it into something wonderful, something beautiful, something of great value. The old is gone, the new is come. You know, for many years I was raised in a culture that talked a lot about the idea of grace and that God loves us just the way we are. But every time I heard that statement, God loves us just the way we are, someone came along with a conditional statement saying, but now that you're a Christian, you've got to, you've got to, have you heard that? But now that you're a Christian, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta work at it. You know, you gotta, you gotta quit swearing, you gotta quit, you know, you gotta quit. Now I'm coming out of the Baptist background, so all of you are excluded. You gotta quit, quit smoking. You gotta quit. You can't drink alcohol. You, 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 you can't go to movies. You don't dance. And, and all those things made me the beautiful Christian that I am. And you know what really bothers me? For years I believed that lie. You see, when we talk about the grace of God, we're not talking about grace that comes because we're good enough to receive it. We're talking about grace that comes because we're not good enough, therefore we need it. And many of us live with the, with the false concept that Christianity means now I have a clean slate, or now I'm going to work harder so that I can prove for others around me that I'm a Christian. And yet, I don't believe that that's true. I don't believe that performance has anything to do with Christianity, with our faith. What our faith is based on is based on the fact that God has chosen to love us. He has chosen to accept us. He has chosen to take that which is broken and make it that which is perfect. But it isn't the future event. Sometimes we talk about, well, when I get to heaven, I'll be perfect. No, 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 no. You don't have to get to heaven to be perfect. You've already been made perfect. Now, does that mean you don't screw up? Does that mean you don't make mistakes? Does that mean that that you, you don't do stupid stuff? Ask my wife. She'll tell you a lot of truth about you, about me, that you don't know. But you see, that has nothing to do with my identity in Christ. 
Because you see, Christ paid the penalty for sin, past, present, and future. And we have been made whole. We have been made pure. We have been made faultless. Now that doesn't mean we aren't going to screw up. That doesn't mean that we aren't going to do stupid stuff. We all are. But because of Christ, we have been made new. And so instead of going to God and saying, God, I screwed up again, um, and, and, and just take a whip out and start beating, you know there are people that actually do that? They walk around with whips and they whip themselves and beat themselves to beat the shame out of, or the sin out of themselves. Sometimes we as Christians do the same thing. We walk around going, oh man, I screwed up that time. Ooh, that was dumb. And we beat ourselves. We may not beat ourselves verbally out loud, but we beat ourselves inside. There are some things in my life that I really screwed up in. Things that my wife doesn't even know. Where I really messed up. And you know, for years after that experience, I spent all my time going, I've got to work harder, I've got to be a better person, I've got to, well, that was really stupid, I can't do that again, da 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 And what happened was, I lost the joy that Christ has offered us through Christ's death and resurrection. I lost the joy of being made new because I was spending so much time dwelling on the fact that I screwed up. I believe this with all my heart. When we, when we enter into God's presence and we recognize that we screwed up, we go into God's presence and we don't say, Oh, God, am I a rotten sinner. We go into God's presence and say, You know, God, I know I screwed up. I know I really did poorly. But thank you that I am already forgiven. Thank you that I have been already made new. It isn't about living in our failures. It's about living in the light of our, of the truth of the matter, of our newness. We are new. It isn't future. It's now. So when Lowell said, I'm perfect, and he said it with a smirk on his face, he doesn't have to smirk. Because you see, when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when we discover who Christ is in our lives, we are made perfect. So, how many of you this morning see yourselves as perfect? Not convinced, are you? <laughs> let, me, um, let me reread the passage that was read, and then I'm going to add a few more verses to it. You see, through the controlling force in our lives, uh, see, you see, the, see, this reading thing is tough for me. You see, the controlling force in our lives is the love of the Anointed One. And our confession is this, one died for all, therefore all have died. He died for us so that we would be made, we would all be made alive. Not for ourselves, but for Him who died and who rose from the dead. Because of all that God has done, we now have a new perspective. Because of what now what God has done, we have a new perspective. And a challenge for us who sit in the pew on a Sunday after Sunday who want to beat ourselves up for our failures, we need to go remind ourselves we have a new perspective. That new perspective is we've been made, made perfect. We've been made whole. We've been made pure. We have a new perspective. So often we as Christians live in the old perspective. We live in the shame of our failures. But the scripture says we have been given a new perspective. We used to show regret for people based on worldly standards and interests. No longer, we used to think of the united the same way. No longer. Therefore, if anyone is united with the anointed one, if anyone has a relationship with Jesus Christ, the person is a new creation. The old is gone. And see, a new life has begun. All of this is a gift from the Creator God who pursued us and brought us into a restored and healthy relationship with Him through the anointed. And He has given us the same mission. 
the mission of reconciliation to bring others back to him. Let me just uh, say it one more time. Jesus Christ came and he lived on this earth. He came for one purpose and one purpose only. He came to bring mankind into a right relationship with God. What's a right relationship with God? Well, a right relationship with God means that that, that which He created at the beginning were with Adam and Eve who, who screwed up and chose another direction. God had to fix that. And He couldn't we couldn't fix it. We couldn't stop not sinning. We couldn't stop not screwing up. We can't stop not screwing up. And so there was, there was a need between for God to be in relationship to us. And so when Christ came, He came to give us new life. To take that which began at the beginning to be perfect and holy. And He, made, he came to die so that we might be made pure and holy and perfect. And the problem is, many of us choose to live, continue to live in the old nature because we don't believe that we have been made new. The problem is, many of us seek to perform the faith journey because we think that by doing a good job we can show God that we love Him and therefore we will be invited into His kingdom. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is alive from the pit of hell. That is what Satan is whispering in your ear. Because you see, Christ came to have relationship to us. Now, He gave us a choice. Now, some of you maybe haven't made the choice yet. Some of you maybe are out there wandering and floundering and don't have a relationship to Christ. And if you do, then you have good reason to continue to live in the misery of your defeat. But you see, Christ came and He gave us a choice to say, I accept your forgiveness for all my sins, past, present, and future. Thank you, God, that I have been made new. You know, you know why the church has become ineffective today? You know why most of us have become ineffective in our faith today? It's because too often we have this idea that this is what we should do, this is how we should do it, and so, and then when we don't measure up to it, we kind of go, oh. Or maybe, just maybe, we don't recognize who we really are. Who we really are. Because you see, if we recognize that we have been made new, if we recognize that we have been redeemed, if we recognize that we have been forgiven, then wouldn't we be excited to share that with others? Wouldn't we be excited to be able to say to others, not necessarily in our words, but in our lives, to say, we love you? You know, I, I just want to throw a stab at this one. There's a young woman that is living, staying in a motel right now that is uh, bipolar, that has, um, has no place to go, no place to find support and help. And by a fluke, Sean was around when she called to say, I, I, I need help. Now, I want you to know, sometimes we don't know whether these people are sh shysters or these people are real. But you know one of the things I'm really excited about? Is God hasn't asked me to assess whether they're shysters or real. God is asking me to love them. You know, I look around out here in the audience and God hasn't asked me to evaluate your spiritual lives. God hasn't asked me to check it out and make sure that you guys are acting right. I remember a pastor in my, in my history that would go into bars and find his people and yell at them and tell them to get out of the bar and get back and get out of that sinful living and he would beat people up. It's a Baptist. Folks, I'm not going to go to a bar to find out whether you're hanging out. I'm not going to go anywhere to find out whether you're drunk. 
I'm not going to go to find out whether you're doing something sinfully wrong. I'm not going to do that because, you see, my job isn't to make sure that you're behaving right. You know what my job is? My job is to love you. My job is to build you up. My job is to encourage you. My job is to walk alongside of you. And what Sean, to the support of many of you here this morning, did is she went to a, a woman who Sean Ring believes is authentic and real and said to her, we care. Now, how far will we go with that? I don't know. If, if, she's, if she's a shyster, I don't know. But it really doesn't matter. Because you see, God has commissioned us to love others as He has loved us. As the church, let's quit assessing who is and who isn't. Let's quit looking to find out whether they measure up or don't measure up. But let's begin to love our neighbor just like God loves you. We have been made new. And once we understand that we've been made new, I'm going to ask you the question. Are you perfect? Are you whole? And every one of you is going to raise your hand. Because you see, it's what Christ has done. We are made perfect and whole. And the more we begin to believe that truth, the more we will begin to see ourselves as beacons of light, as encouragers, as hope givers, as lovers of others, because we know that we've been made new. Therefore, we can share that newness with others and watch God do great things in them because they know that we know that they are loved by God. Let's pray. Shoot, could have gone on, God. You know, God... I believe for too long we've been wasting our time talking about how we fail and not talking about how we have been made new. Lord, that's a process that takes a lot of growing in our relationship to you. So Father, this morning I pray that, that out of this these moments together, that we might be encouraged to continue to explore our newness. That we might be encouraged to grow in our understanding of who you are and your love for us, so that we might begin to celebrate our newness. And that we might be able to put past behind us that where we fail. Lord, I pray. I pray that for myself. Because God, I know at times I live with the guilt of not doing good enough. And yet, God, I have come to the place of believing that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because Scripture says, I have been made new. Let us live in the newness of your forgiveness. And Father, if there are those here this morning that, that, that don't have a relationship with Christ, that don't understand this concept of being forgiven, Lord, I pray that you would bring them to a place of wanting to discover a God who brings us to wholeness, to healthiness. We have a choice. To live in the confidence of who you are and what you've done for us. Or to live in the shame of our failures. Bring us to a place of confidence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.